Hello, this is a section on molecular theory and techniques. I'm going to give you a very quick and brief introduction to molecular diagnostics. It's not a major part of your curriculum for the MLT program, but a lot of the clinical sites that you'll be working at, especially the larger hospitals and research facilities, will be doing this type of testing, so it's important to at least understand a little bit about how it works. All right, molecular techniques. These are assays that target nucleic acid instead of protein. Think of DNA, what we're made out of. It con consists of a binding of a nucleic acid to its complementary target nucleic acid sequence. So every type of cell, every type of bacteria has its own specific DNA sequencing that we are looking for. If we're able to create a probe to that sequence, or if we're able to actually amplify those sequences, we're able to pick up testing a lot faster. Think of a situation like, um, this is a good one, microbiology. If anybody knows um, that bacteria take a couple days to grow, it can be very unfortunate for a patient or a hospital situation. So if a patient comes in the hospital and they may have MARSA, which is methicillin resistant staph aureus, um, they could pass that on to some immunocompromised people. They could get very ill and unfortunately pass away. Well, we want to prevent that situation from occurring. So what we do when a patient is positive for MARSA in a wound or an infection is we isolate them in a room by themselves. Unfortunately, because it takes a couple days for bacteria to grow in the microbiology department, we may not be able to tell the physician that that's in fact what the patient has till 48 hours later, if we're lucky within 24 hours. So now we have testing that's able to detect that nucleic acid sequence on the Staph aureus bacteria. Not only detect it, but amplify it so we can definitely see it and tell the physician sometimes within an hour or two that that patient does have that bacteria present. So it can um, create a lot of um, success in the treatment of t diseases. You can get the patient treated correctly faster, and you can also isolate those patients from the um, other patients to make sure they don't catch it as well. Um, it's designed to detect changes at the DNA and RNA level, and it's used to, um, it, techniques used in the clinical lab to identify nucleic acid sequences include the enzymatic cleavage of nucleic acids, gel electrophoresis, amplification of target sequences, hybridization of nucleic acid probes. I know you're, look, you're listening to me going, what the heck is she talking about? But like I said, we're just going to worry about the basics. The FDA approved assays for detection um, have been developed in only the last 10 to 15 years. This is pretty new. Um, the lab that I did my clinicals at was just looking into this as I started there as a student. Um, so it's not, it hasn't been along around that long. Some of the key quality issues are sample quality and prepar preparation. You cannot have a contaminated sample. It has to be pure. Sensitivity of reagents to inactivating contaminants. Contaminants are huge. These are put in special rooms. Sometimes there's special sticky mats on the floor to make sure there isn't dust present. Um, things like that to make sure the sample does not become contaminated with some something floating in the air. There's amplification bias and variability. You have to have appropriate controls, restriction enzyme efficiency, and reproducibility and cross-contamination of amplification reactions is an issue. So what does this DNA stuff look like? Well, DNA stores human genetic information. It detects amino acid sequence of peptides and proteins. It's composed of two strands of nucleotides, as you can see. We got the five prime and the three prime over here. Some of them have a hydroxyl end, and we do have a phosphate end. The strands are arranged in what's called a double helix. That is what you're looking at here, this shape. And the helical structure is stable due to many hydrogen bonds between base pairs. Base pairs refer to these here adenosine, tyrosine, guanine, cytosine. So these are all matching pairs. Uh, we also have hydrophobic bonds between bases. Bonds can be broken and um, strands denatured and separated, which is part of the testing. Then we have RNA. RNA is single-stranded. It's different from DNA in three ways. The ribose de um, replaces the deoxyribose as the sugar. Uracil replaces thiamine, and RNA is single-stranded. So here we have DNA on the left-hand side and RNA on the right-hand side. It works together with DNA to synthesize proteins. 
DNA is routinely denatured, binds to RNA, and reanneals to establish new DNA. We have hybridization techniques, nucleic acid probes. These are um, quicker testing. A nucleic acid probe is a short strand of DNA or RNA of a known sequence um, looking for a test target. One of the tests that we used to do was uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia. And it, this test would use a probe to look for a specific sequence that's only found on the chlamydia or the gonorrhea type of bacteria. If that is annealed to it, the probe has a, um, a some type of a reaction that takes place that we're able to detect to say if it's positive or negative. So we're looking for a specific target. So it's more specific than say an amino assay. Then we have target amplification. In vitro methods for enzymatic replication of a target molecule to levels at which it can be readily detected. This allows the target sequence to be identified and further characterized. The most widely used is polymerase chain reaction called PCR. There's also transcription mediated amplification, strand displacement amplification, and nucleic acid based amplification. PCR is what is most commonly used in laboratories today. How does PCR work? PCR is super cool. It enzymatically synthesizes millions of identical copies of target DNA to increase analytical sensitivity. When I first started in the laboratory, how the chlamydia testing was done, they would take a genital swab and put it on a slide. We would then overlay the slide with some type of a fluorescent antibody in which we would sit in a dark room looking for any type of fluorescence. If there was fluorescence, it could potentially mean that there's chlamydia present. Well, imagine a case where there's only a couple chlamydia organisms on one slide. <coughs> oh, excuse me. When that happens, you could potentially miss that area of the slide or not see it, okay? What PCR does is it makes millions of identical copies of DNA from one organism. So where there was one organism, there's now millions. Not organisms, the DNA. But it creates a ton of DNA, therefore we can see it faster. When the target is microbial RNA or messenger RNA, RNA must be enzymatically converted to DNA by reverse transcriptase, which is part of the reaction. One of the latest innovations is real-time PCR. I'll talk about that in a second. One of the issues with PCR, though, is it's very expensive. We need thermocyclers. There can be aerosol contamination and um, issues that way. The latest innovation is this real-time PCR. How real-time PCR is different is talking about the patient that had the MARSA again. What we do is we take the patient's nasal swab and run it through a thermocycler. And we are constantly making copies of target DNA in the thermocycler. And once there's enough there that the analyzer can detect it, it calls it positive. It could be positive in 15 minutes, it could be positive in two hours. It just keeps cycling until it comes up positive. This is wonderful for things like influenza testing. This is what the hospital I used to work at is using it for now. Um, it's very specific and you can tell the physician with utmost certainty within 15 minutes to a half hour usually that their influenza testing is positive. Here's a picture of uh, PCR and how it happens. First thing we have is the target DNA, okay? We have the two, two strands, and we denature it with heat. Okay, remember we talked about thermocycling? It separates the two strands. We then add these primers. You can see this five prime, five prime here. And what it does is it creates another copy by annealing. And we also have a, a soup of, um, what do you call those, uh, proteins that are, uh, sorry, amino acids, that are annealing to that, creating a whole new strand. So here we've created an, more strands. Then we take the two new strands we've created, we denature them again with heat, and then we add primers to those. So as you can see, by the time we do 20 to 30 cycles, we are exponentially increasing tons of DNA. Well, once we attach a probe to this with a some type of a, um, reagent on it that could be, um, enzyme with a color or a light, we're able to detect whether or not that um, bacteria or organism would be present. That concludes my very quick and dirty version of molecular diagnostics for clinical chemistry.